if you're a smaller farmer, you'd find it very hard to survive. We first started with one farm years ago, and then we bought the neighbour, the neighbour. So over 25 years, we've basically bought out 25 different farmers just to become viable. Hey, I'm Joey, and I'm one of the 30 AI voices from Speechlow. You listen to this video and... There's very few young people coming into the ag industry which you really couldn't afford to get into the industry unless you're actually born in it now. Um, in, in Bundy, the price of land's roughly between ten to $25,000 an acre, um, which means if it's a good farm, you're up to for $2 million before you've got a house, before you buy your tractors, and then before you buy seed. No one realises the total cost on doing business. If you've got 100 people out there in the paddock, it's $3,000 an hour. Everyone has to do it better, pay more money to people, but if there's no money to pay, you can't do it. You know what I mean? We've got these three products here. They do 40 hectares of spray, which is 100 acres, which is a fair bit. $5,000. $5,000. I think that's $5,000 something dollars. $80,000 in this bin. This two machines here cost just around the 500000 to buy those, both those components there. Yeah, it's got to be numbers, yeah. You've got to ex put out big volumes to make any money because it's only a couple of dollars a box profit, if a profit. We're lucky that the prices have gone up because that's the only reason I think a lot of us are still here is because our values are going up and you can lend against your value. Outside investment companies have come and actually look because we got the only parcel left of a couple thousand acres in one spot. I personally don't know where all the money's coming from, but there's some mass amount of money being put into Bundy, and a lot of it's investment money. It's all secured income, but nothing's guaranteed. Uh, this is April 2003. There would be quite a few landholders in there. Um, it's gone from being pretty much all cane land to only that bit there and those bits up there and a few bits in, through there that are still used for cropping. Up until about 2012, the um, rural uh, land index sat at about 6.3%. Um, about Compare that to what we've seen in the last 10 years where there's been 100 to 300% increases in some asset classes, um, in my view at least, it's a, it's a level of growth that would only be observed once in a, in a lifetime. The boom's been created by cheap money, low interest rates, um, really strong commodity prices in some ag sectors or quite a few ag sectors. Institutional investment at a capacity that we probably haven't seen before. Those who have been able to expand have, have obviously done that. There are old photos, of course. Mum was 18 and the middle one's 21 for Dad before, before he went to war and the one on the right's when he came home from war. He was about nearly 25 there. If Dad was still alive, he'd be 103. Actually, tomorrow. Well, I've been living here for 53 years, on and off. On and off for 53 years. Uh, it was came from here to town. There was, might have been the odd block of pumpkins growing, maybe a few melons, but very rarely. It was all sugar cane. The families have moved off. The young ones have moved off. There's not too many young people, more or less, going from generation to generation on the, on the farm. Some are, not too many. A lot of the farms are sold on. So? Well, in today's world, investors, they come in and they buy the farm. They don't want a farm. They want to buy the farm and then resell it in a couple of years, make big profit. Well, I had cancer and I made a rash decision and I sold the farm. I shouldn't have done that. But, uh, you make these decisions, we think it's a good idea at the time. Sell the property, the farm got a lot less than what it's worth today, but at the time it was a good price. The big people want to rule, the little people don't matter. Councils will tell you they'd rather deal with two or three big fellas than 200 farmers. 
people sit there and say, oh, I'm a bit concerned about foreign investment or we're losing control of the farms. But at the end of the day, a rising tide floats all ships. Farmland and resources are, are becoming more scarce. We're seeing associated with that new investors globally are coming into the market. Foreign investment has helped increase the output, the productivity, the access to markets and obviously land values and farmers in Australia has been a big benefactor of that. The upsides of operating as a larger scale agribusiness are obviously around efficiencies, how you manage your costs, how you farm, how you adapt technology and creating more margin for your product. As this consolidation occurs, there's going to be a balancing act between the big getting bigger and the big getting too big, and what impact that's going to have on the smaller farmer. There's my cherry picker. This bit of land is me. It's my farm. What I grow in it is what my ancestors, they grew in the, in the past. And I sell all this stuff at the markets, no contracts at all. Like me, I'm Italian, my wife is Filipina, putting our ideas together and this is what we got. Everything I do is me and my wife and my kids. Thank you so much. Have a good day. If I say get a heart attack tomorrow, this is owned by my wife or my kids. Not like these other blokes, they can't talk because they're millions of dollars in debt. They're doing it harder than, harder than everybody else, the big farmers. They just keep rolling it over and over and over. That's all they do. But I can't live that way. Eventually, little pocket farmers like this, they won't, they won't exist because, well, there won't be no people owning land anyway. This is some pumpkin that's been just left behind just because of poor pricing. That pumpkin in the supermarket would probably retail for $24. Really, at the end of the day, when we put it into the market, after freight and picking and packing, we'd probably get uh, 60 cents. These pumpkins here are sitting here because it'd cost us more to pick, pack and send than we'd actually get back out of it. So it may as well stay here at $15,000 an acre, just drop the shit on the ground. Personally, I think everyone in the industry is actually tired. I personally don't sleep. I got my eyes shut, but I wake up in the morning, I, I've worked problems out overnight, and <laughs> I don't sleep. We're at the stage now, we're not going no bigger. We're it, that's it. If anything, probably getting smaller. <laughs> yeah, we'll get out. <laughs> yeah. mm. You mean if I had the chance again, Definitely not. Never sell it. You learn a lot and real estate agents and people in business, they will not tell you the pitfalls. You either learn them or you know them or you, you get walked over. I guess the final thing is you, you don't see many uh, large amounts of farms and things like that boarding an aeroplane to go back overseas. The asset stays here. We've got a, a legal system around the ownership of that asset. I will never be rich. I'll never be a millionaire doing this. We live, and we live healthy. All right, all right. Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for... Uh, we played that video just to wait for everyone to get in the room. It normally takes a few minutes for everyone to uh, arrive, and I just want to... Uh, say welcome to everyone. It looks like we've got people from all around the world. Um, if you haven't already commented, we'd love to know where you're joining us from. We've got people here from uh, Sydney, which is very local. We've got people from um, from, New from New Zealand, from the Fiji, from Lismore, uh, Maloon Creek near Orange. Hello, Leanne. Lovely to see you here. Sydney. Hi, Dan. Uh, India, Melbourne, New Zealand, everywhere. It's so great to be able to host a webinar and know that we've got people from all around the world uh, joining us here, some from Shepparton, Malaysia, um, Victoria. <laughs> I see what you've did there, Peter. Very clever. Um, so yeah, just wanted to welcome you all. I'm very excited to be hosting tonight's webinar. Um, 
uh, my name's Regen Ray. If you don't know who I am from Farming Secrets and the Soil Learning Center, you're going to be also hearing from Teal soon from AgriSol. And we're going to be joined by Darren, who is from Bricklet, um, going to be talking about the moving parts. So as you saw in that video, there are big investment firms coming in and just buying land and sitting on it and not even farming and creating food. And then if someone is farming, it's not profitable and they're leaving pumpkins on the ground to rot and then there's food shortages. So something needs to change and you're in the right room because tonight you're going to be exposed to some new ideas, some new thoughts. And uh, we would like you to have an open mind and uh, really just see what's available um, because sometimes we don't know what we don't know. And that's what tonight's all about is discovering new ways of um of seeing the world so meta farms is the company that um is in conjunction with bricklet uh to bring you this uh project um so tonight let's give the undivided attention to whoever's speaking but also be interactive we love seeing the flow of chat coming in seeing who's here and uh asking questions we're going to collect the questions and answer them all at the end uh we also love seeing feedback from the room so i really invite you to uh, open your screen or your, your, your video and start sharing. We love seeing nods. Um, um, keep yourself muted uh, because that's a bit distracting um, and I'll keep an eye on, on that as well. But have fun and be in the moment. And uh, yes, the number one question is, will this be recorded and will there be a replay and will there be slides? And I can answer yes to all of those. You'll get an email in the next 24 hours uh, with all the replay. Just be mindful that we are recording and we are also streaming live on Facebook, YouTube and LinkedIn. So if you have issues with being seen on those platforms, then keep your video muted or, or turned off. So we are streaming and we are recording. So on that note, welcome everyone. Um, I might hand over to Darren. Darren, you are available to unmute. Darren's going to take us through uh, what Bricklet is and how Bricklet works, because it is a little bit of a new concept when it comes to what's known as fractional ownership of a property. So Darren, welcome to the room. And uh, yeah, just uh, if you could take over for a bit and uh, see how Absolutely. Great. Thanks, Ray. Um, well, thanks everyone for joining tonight. I think it's going to be a, a really interesting conversation as we take the uh, the concept of uh, fractional ownership or owning a piece of property um, to the next level when it comes to, you know, potentially owning a farm using the same, uh, using the same method. So I'm going to start by just kind of talking a little bit about giving a bit of an intro around Bricklet uh, and what it is. Um, and then I'll go into a specific kind of example of um, of actually, you know, uh, how it actually works for commercial property. So to start with, I mean, Bricklet was designed for uh, to to help people be successful in property. So, you know, the prices of properties, as we know, is kind of going up and up and up over over time. And um, and the only real way to um, to help assist in having people get into the property market is to be able to break down the property into smaller pieces and that's what we do with bricklet and that's what bricklet's all about so um to start with the the background of bricklet it started as a way for everybody to really share in that success of what property is and what property can do as an asset class so that could be either owning residential property could be owning commercial property uh, it could be owning mean, farm assets, could be owning any, anything that involves uh, property, which is, um, if you saw in the video, you know, they talked about, you know, the percentage increase over time. So property as an asset class, especially in Australia, you know, over the last, you know, 20, 30, 50 years has continually kind of, um, you know, gradually gone up and up and up. So um, to the point now where it actually is very hard for people that don't have uh, much savings to get onto the property ladder. So with Bricklet, that's what it's all about. And it's all about trying to help people do that. So we've built a platform uh, that helps people buy smaller pieces of brick, uh, smaller pieces of property. And what that does is it's all done online. Uh, so it keeps it really, really simple and, and a, a really streamlined process. And what you actually end up with is you're owning a piece of property. And if that is uh, returning an income via a rental, uh, rental income, then that's shared by the by the owners. So to give a really the easiest way to really understand it is if I show an example of um, of bricklet. So if I have a look at a commercial example, what I'll show next is uh, let me just share another image here, which will show uh, a really simple example of one of our properties, which is a uh, an asset, which is a, a a pub. It's a hotel in Sydney. 
And um, if you have a look at that, you can see there, um, the bricklet price is $25,000. So for $25,000, you go in a piece of this asset, um, there's 700 of them. So that will give you an idea of the total asset size or the value of the total asset. Um, and with this asset, there's a 10 year lease. Um, you can see there the rental yield of about four and a half, just over four and a half percent. So what it means is if somebody owns a $25,000 piece or, or, or multiples of that, um, for each piece that they own, um, they're going to be getting a rental income of about 1100 you know, just over $1,100 a year. So again, that comes down to that kind of 4.5% yield. So you actually own a piece of the, in this example, um, own a piece of the pub. So it kind of really outlines or, or um, kind of shows how simple it is um, using the platform uh, to own an asset like this. So we started this uh, platform about three years ago. We've uh, along the way, uh, we've worked with some big players in the residential property space. So we have Mervac and Stockland uh, shareholders in Brickland. They come on board the journey at the very beginning. Since then, uh, we also have uh, via a, a fund, we also have uh, realestate.com.au and News Corp as investors in Brickland as well. So they're also shareholders. So we've got some significant industry players that are backing uh, Brickland as a platform. But keep in mind that Bricklet is purely just a software, uh, a software service, right? So think of us kind of like eBay for property, you know, where you can you can put on the the property, but what we do as a as something that is different to you know selling whole properties is that we actually break it up and so people can buy the pieces and we manage all that um, from a technology point of view and all the so we have the asset manager who joins the platform to be able to pay the rent. Um, we have the, the conveyances that join the platform to be able to do the conveyance side. We have you know, a number of players that, that join uh, the platform to do their specific job in the property world. So if you look at this same example, you could then apply that same thing uh, to a farm. And that's what tonight's webinar is all about, is to really look at, you know, could we apply this or how would we apply this to a farm asset to help people uh, you know, in the industry. So that could be uh, for a number of reasons. One is to help more investors or more people come and own uh, farmland in, in smaller pieces. And then on the other side is, you know, if you are a farm owner and you've got an asset, you know, there could be a way to, to sell down pieces of it to, to then continue on uh, with the operations without actually doing it through a finance, um, you know, through a finance company. So it could be a way for, uh, for farm assets to actually continue by selling off a piece and then renting it back. So there's there's many different ways that we are looking at how do we help the industry. So we're definitely keen to to work with um, you know to work with the guys on how we can deploy this you know for farmland. Awesome, so exciting. I think um you know this is definitely the way of the future. And I I I just want to quick share a quick story that I heard of Bricklet on a on a podcast. Um, th probably about three years ago. And I, I straight away went, wow, this could be applied for farmland. And um, I emailed the staff and was chatting. And then the conversation, you know, we kind of got busy and COVID happened and whatnot. And then a couple of months ago, we were talking about meta farms and how this could happen. I'm like, this is brick, the bricklet mob that I know about. And I'd moved to Sydney. And then I was like, oh my God, they're in Manly. Now I can go to the their offices and meet them. And then I shared to Teal about it and I, I emailed and the email came back and it bounced. That staff member wasn't there anymore. And then I just went to the generic email and Darren replied and said, Ray, you wouldn't believe it. I was just thinking about you the other day because farmland is something that we're wanting to um, get into as well. And so like, it was just so interesting that the universe aligned, you know, three years ago, maybe not everyone was ready for this, but here we are now. So thanks so much, Darren, for sharing that. Um, I'm going to pass over to, to Teal. Um, Teal's going to share a little bit more about what MetaFarms is all about and um, some of the moving parts. And remember, if you've got any questions, pop them into the chat. Um, and at any point during the presentation, um, I guess what we're here to do today is get expressions of interest. So I just want to make sure that everyone has the links that they, they want. Uh, and need. So at any point during the presentation, if you're like, this is something I'm really interested in, I want to put up my hand, the way that you say yes is by going to the website that's now in chat. Um, and I'll fix that. So it's actually linkable, but it's by metafarm.com. Um, so at any point, if you want to raise your hand, there's no commitment. We're really just trying to, as you can see, get a bit of a feel of who's interested, how many and ask questions and see where this is kind of sitting at. So Teal, over to you, my friend. Yeah, awesome. G'day, everyone. Um, so, yeah, this is MetaFarm. Um, just 
something uh, throwing back to Bricklet. I believe it's uh, all uh, on Title II, so it's not uh, indirectly owning um, uh, the property. It's directly having your name on title, and I believe, uh, Darren, correct me if I'm wrong, it's owners in common? Uh, yeah, we use tenants in common for tenants, uh, yeah. for the property, um, but it's all, um, yeah, so it's not done as a financial service. So Brickler doesn't have a financial services license, so we're not running this as a managed investment scheme or anything like that, so purely, um, purely as a property play, yeah. Yeah. Awesome. So it's you're you're actually buying the property just in small bits. Cool. So just before we start, I'd just like to say this is not um, financial advice. This is purely educational and letting you guys know that this is an option that is out there. If you are considering uh, buying farmland or buying a bricklet in the future, always talk to a trusted financial expert um, or advisor. Um, don't rely on on us to give you advice. Go seek your own independent advice. So that's that's very important. I'd also like to start by saying there's heaps of risks in everything and farmland is no exception to that too. So there's a couple of ways that um, farmland can be risky. The first one is that uh, increased rates may cause for a drop in price as people are able to borrow less. Um, it can cause for people to be unable to buy um, or push up those prices. Another one is exotic uh, diseases. If Unfortunately, your livestock die, that will uh, reduce your operating income. Drought, same thing. It reduces your operating income. Um, flood, commodity prices, and bushfires too. They can all reduce your operating income. So there's, there's still lots of risks in farmland, some of which uh, affect the price uh, and some of which uh, affect your income. And so um, I, uh, to my understanding, the, uh, the price is a multiple of the the income of the property, and so if that risks if that risk affects the long term production of the farm, then also uh, the value of the farm. And so I think starting off, um, I guess this talk talking about the risks and, and putting everyone on with the expectation that there are risks to farmland, I think sets the uh, scene very well. Also, Meta Farms is not um, a digital farm. It's a, it's a proper in real life farm. And we're all about uh, the transformation of a real farm through Regent Ag. And so this comes back to our name, Meta Farm. And Meta, think about um, uh, metamorphic rocks. They've undergone this process to change into something um, perhaps better. And so going back to that definition, it denotes a change in uh, position or condition. And that's what we want to do to um, a farm pretty much. We want to be able to regenerate it into a more productive uh, and uh, ecologically you know, uh, enhanced place. And that throws back to our, almost our uh, tagline, boldly regenerative. So there's a couple of things that have been on my mind recently when it comes to farmland. And the first one is that we're all pretty much being priced out of the market. And as a, as a young person myself, I would not be able to come up with a $2.8 million deposit on an entry-level property. That's like That just for a deposit is pretty crazy. Like we're talk in, in terms of um, uh, residential you know, um, property, the uh, deposit on, on that is relatively smaller compared to farms with a 50% LVR. And so it's it's very hard for people starting off, definitely if you're not born into uh, a farming background, to get exposure or to run um, a farm. The other challenge to getting into farmland is that it requires a large amount of knowledge to firstly run a successful farm, but also to select a farm that is of uh, investment grade or that will that is in a is in a good location and will be productive, because it's it's I guess that characteristic which will drive um, appreciation but with that in mind we're missing out on potentially a lot of uh, gains the first one is that farmland historically has been uh, market beating and so this report from our rural bank which is a really good report I'd, I'd highly recommend checking out it's the Australian farmland values and it pretty much outlines that Australian farmland has really outperformed a lot of different asset classes, such as residential real estate, uh, ASX 200. Um, and you can see in that diagram there, it's it's definitely going from uh, the bottom uh, left to the top right. 
as you can see here, this is in the um, the report. The uh, compound annual growth over the last 20 years for uh, both uh, Queensland, New South Wales, and Victoria has been above 8%. And that's just that's just the uh, appreciation, not um, not including the uh, the lease they get back from le leasing our farm. We're also missing out on uh, inflation hedge. So pretty much with inflation, um, as uh, your money is almost being eaten away um, if you're keeping it as cash, pretty much, and even in the bank. So if we were to buy something last year that was a hundred dollars. At the end of this year, it might be you know, $107.75. Inflation at the end of this year is expected to peak at 7.75%. Um, and so when we think about our purchasing power of our money, really, we're, we're reducing what we're able to buy. And so if we do keep our money in the bank and perhaps we're gaining a 2% interest, which is you'd be pretty lucky to be you know, gaining that, that amount of interest, in reality, we're going to be losing 5.75% of purchasing power. And so one of the, the big values of um, buying into farmland is that it protects your purchasing power, uh, purchasing power as farm farmland is usually protected from inflation as farms produce food and food is usually something that gets inflated. And so for that reason, the farm's income is protected and so the value of the farm is also protected, if that makes sense. We're also missing out on a very low volatile asset class. And so this is a, a diagram taken from uh, Acre Trader, which is a US company. They do a fantastic job with their uh, educational resources. So I'd highly recommend checking them out too. But this just, this just shows the relative um, uh not risk, but um, volatility that farm ha uh, farmland has compared to other asset classes. So it's right in between AAA rated bonds and well, US government bonds. And so when we consider that in terms of its uh, volatility, it's pretty, I'm not saying safe, but it has low volatility. Uh, it also has um, pretty good returns for that volatility too. Again, I'd highly recommend checking out Acre Trader. They got heaps of resources if you're interested in learning more about um, buying farmland. We're not affiliated with them. I just think they're they're pretty good in terms of their education. Uh, just a note: Acre Trader is only for sophisticated investors. Um, that's something that Bricklet almost solves. You don't have to be a sophisticated investor, which is you have to reach certain uh, requirements uh, in terms of your, your net wealth. It opens up the opportunity to buy these asset classes without, or pretty much to, to everyone that has um, the ability to do, to do so. So, Ray, why are they buying our land? Do you want to fill us in on that? Sure thing, mate. Uh, so this was quite interesting. The article was in uh, the <clears throat> AFR. This uh, was about a couple of weeks ago, actually. Um, the link is down the bottom and it's kind of hard to click, but we, we will uh, share the, the the slides. But this is Ray Dalio. Now, if you don't know who he is, he's a very large uh, investor in America. He's um, quite followed. He's done an amazing presentation recently about the, the changing of potential wealth of different countries and whether the order of uh, the dominant currency may change. And he's written a whole book about that as well. Um, but what I really find interesting is that he has kind of picked Australia farmland to be a kind of hedge against inflation. And he's also called it a safe haven bet. Now he's used the word bet because obviously, you know, he doesn't know how it's going to pan out, but I get really kind of interested when I see signals like this. Um, these people have large amounts of teams and people and they're in inner circles. They're probably attending events that majority of people don't get access to or have the ability to go to. And these are the type of decisions uh, that they're making. It's also no secret that um, Bill Gates is buying a lot of farmland and he's one of the largest privately holder of land in America now. And we have to kind of just zoom out and look at those dots and say, why is that? You know, and so um, just find it really interesting that the, the not only are people overseas looking at farmland, but they're also specifically looking uh, at, at Australian farmland. So 
Um, now, this isn't some kind of website. This is the Australian Financial Review, quite reputable and, you know, wouldn't be sharing stuff like this unless they had lots of validation b between it. Um, and, you know, he says, you know, it's the lucky country. It's got great resources. It's got great approach to life and it's got Australians, you know. So I just thought it was quite uh, – and that he personally loves a place as well. So, um yeah, these, these are people with large amounts of team doing the research, crunching the numbers, and this is kind of where they're picking to buy land from. And, you know, I guess from our point of view, our, our method to the madness is to let's keep that money in Australia by people for the people rather than allowing externals to come in and monopolise the farmland. And some of these people aren't even probably going to do anything with it. They're just land banking, which means buy the land, hold on it and ride the inflation wave. Yeah, and Bill Gates too. I think he's the largest uh, owner of US farmland. Um, and, and one of the things that these guys aren't really doing is they're not regenerating their land. They're, as Ray said, they're sitting on their land and they're kind of just not utilising it. What we want to do is really improve the, firstly, the uh, soil fertility, but also the ecology of the, of the whole farm. So it's regen ag is this really unique opportunity where we can do, we can have this really, awesome environmental impact but we can also have a profitable um uh, farm too so that's where i guess our partnership with bricklet comes into place we want to open up the opportunity for uh for everyone to be able to have access to this um asset class which is farmland and so um what we're going to be doing is we're going to be fractionalizing the ownership of our farmland and allowing everyone to gain access to uh, buying a bricklet, gaining all of the benefits, including um, uh, the appreciation and payments from uh, the lease um, at a very accessible price and have your name on title. So it's we're not going through a, a trust structure or a, um, a company structure where yeah, you indirectly own a bit of the farm. You Your name is on on the title, which is, which is pretty awesome. It overcomes so many um, it's problems. So previously I said there was two problems with um, us almost getting into farmland and that's the price and uh, our knowledge. And so price, instead of buying a $5.6 million entry property, we can now buy through bricklets an already productive property for uh, 10 to 20K. Now we're gonna aim to get um, each bricklet between 15K for um, uh, when it opens. Um, now, when, when in time, that might change depending on um, the, the owners of the bricklets and what they want to sell it at. But um, when it starts, we're going to aim for each bricklet to be uh, 15K. And so that accessibility to pretty much having access, uh, exposure to farmland as an asset is, you know, we significantly increase that accessibility and you don't have to take out a massive loan just to get it. You can put a, a small bit of, your um is portfolio towards it the next one was knowledge you don't really need to know exactly how to operate a farm or how to go search for a good farm um that will be all taken care of we'll be leasing it out um, and running the farm so you don't really have to now it is important um you should still be doing your own research and due diligence we'll provide as much information on the property as, as possible answer everyone's questions as best we can and have full transparency um and just because we're happy or someone else is happy to uh, to buy a farm doesn't mean you are so you gotta make sure to speak to a uh, trusted financial advisor this is not financial advice so make sure to go seek out as much information as you can and to, and to do your own research the general plan for MetaFarm is, um, so firstly, to use the Bricklet model, but also to have a community-owned regenerative farm where all the, opera, uh, all the owners will get a return from land appreciation and cash lease, uh, lease payments. And so here in a diagram, we have um, the owners or potentially um, some people in, in this core. You own the farm. The farm is then leased to MetaFarm, which will then um, run the farm regeneratively. Now, uh, not this is no promises, but the idea that increasing the soil fertility will then increase the productivity of the farm, which then will increase the value of the farm. Now, I'm not saying that's a guarantee, um, but 
in my mind, that's pretty logical. If you're paying a multiple of the pro uh, productivity of the farm and you can increase the productivity, then you would also increase um, the value of the farm more than what the, I guess, the background or the local area is growing at. Um, and then, of course, later repayments back to owners. Now, there's also a whole lifestyle and farm benefits um, aspect that we really want to give back to the owners. So we'll be firstly regenerating the farm and we wouldn't be able to do that without um, uh, having help from our community to buy the farm. And that's going to include um, regenerating the soils, planting trees, uh, tree planting projects, um, uh, building riparian zones if there's um, rivers on the property or, or streams. We're also pretty keen to get a community supported agriculture program going, which is buying uh, produce straight from the farm, uh, almost like a farmer's market kind of thing, um, at a wholesale price. And so as an owner, you'll have first access to those uh, kits and, to, um, uh, and the produce of the farm. Now with that, we, we're currently looking mostly at uh, cattle grazing properties. And so it will be uh, beef, um, ideally Angus, premium Angus beef. Um, so that's that's the kind of scope that that we're currently looking at. And of course, farm tours and other events. So we're really keen to have everyone on the farm pretty often. And it's this whole idea of open source learning. So we want everyone to be able to come out the farm on our open days, tour the farm, see exactly what we're doing in terms of, you know, we're rotating the cattle every day or every half day. We're putting in these contour banks uh, to slow down the flow of water. Um, we're increasing diversity in our, in our pastures and to increase um, you know, the amount of trees and, and wildlife on our property. Um, so we really want everyone to be a part of it. And so um, not only will buying a bricklet give you those fantastic returns and um, those low uh, volatile returns, but also it gives you all these lifestyle and farm benefits that I think um, you know, is, is a lot more than, um, than what you can really put a, a price on. So uh, if that does interest you, make sure to think it over first, but make sure to also um, put in your expression of interest. Now, it's a non-binding um, uh, form of interest just to say who's kind of uh, interested in the idea. Um, from there, we can um, you provide an uh, email address that will give you notifications on um, our next webinars and uh, when the bricklets become available. So you can get you can get the um, expression of interest form at the website www.buymetafarm.com. Um, it's just it's a pretty quick form. Um, the idea, yeah, the idea of Metafarm is to take uh, not quite super degraded, but uh, degraded farm and then convert it into this beautiful oasis. Here are some of the principles of region ag. And so we'll be trying to implement every single one of these. Um, ideally, um, you know, using no uh, pesticides um, or herbicides, um, maximizing ground cover, minimize uh, soil disturbance, livestock integration, diversity, all these things that make uh, nutritious, um, uh, dense food, uh, as well as clean food. Uh, you're connected to, I guess, uh, the farmer. Uh, through this, already we've had a bit of uh, a lot of really good feedback, which is which is really exciting to see. So we have uh, a heap of people saying this is so exciting, and and they can't wait to get involved. So um, in my mind, this will be filling up very quickly. Um, so if if you are interested in seeing some uh, potential future farms, we'll be running another webinar in two to three weeks, looking at uh, the farm and what we plan to do with the farm. We'll be roughly going through the farm location. What does the farm actually look like? Farm agronomics. Uh, what do we mean by farming regeneratively? Uh, how would we farm regeneratively? Plan, uh, plans for the farm benefits, including the farm tours, uh, CSA, workshops, courses, um, and the returns as a owner. Here is a sneak peek. So this is a, a property that Ray and I actually went out and had a look at. Um, I, th I think a few weeks, two, four, a couple of weeks ago. Um, it is a 200 hectare grazing uh, property in the New England area. It is um, a pretty nice property. And so that's one of the, the opportunities uh, for you to pretty much buy 
um, and say you got a you got a, a massive farm. So if you are interested in that, make sure to go to the website and um, yeah, just put in a non-binding expression of interest form. Cool. So I think we might open up to um, a Q and A session. Ray, do you have anything you want to <laughs> say? No, very good, mate. Uh, the question. Are flowing in fast. I haven't even been able to copy them all into our, our document. Um, but uh, while while the questions are still streaming in, I think um, one of the things that I wanted to touch on that you mentioned as well, um, and I might um, just share my screen quickly um, if I can continue over, is you, you made a point about like what's kind of you know hedge against inflation, um, and like these these are articles that I read all the time recently. Obviously, being in business, like what businesses do well in a recession, and like number one, groceries. Like everyone's always got to eat. Healthcare, you know, regeneratively grown food is going to reduce your reliance on healthcare. Um, you know, funnily enough, candy, beer, wine, and al like alcohol is kind of like the next category. Um, I find it interesting too as well, pet industry, which kind of makes sense. We saw that in COVID. People wanted a, you know, a furry friend to have as company. Um, so these are these are kind of articles you, you can look at, at these yourselves over and over and over. It's like healthcare and groceries and food is always one of the kind of businesses that thrive during a recession and things like that. So uh, I just wanted to highlight that as well as being a key point that that's kind of why, you know, as prices go up, the farmer gets more money or we can, you know, subscription boxes get access to more reduced costs through CSA models. Um, it's really kind of a security knowing that not only do you have an interest in the farm, but you're going to get first access to getting the food and the produce, which is all the things that are kind of like what we're calling the plus to Bricklet, you know, like Bricklet, I guess, normally helps us solve that uh, slicing up the pie and getting everyone on title and all the, the moving parts as a software service. But then there's all these other benefits that's going to come on top of it um, as, as kind of meta farms and this kind of collective group coming together um, of like-minded people. So it's really excited. Lots of questions. So let's start at the top. Uh, I don't know if there's any order to how we're going to do this. So thanks everyone for all the questions and David, you've asked a lot and we will get through all of them. I'm um, really excited about your keenness. Um, I want to call out that David mentioned that he's got an ideal property and he'd be interested in looking at something like this for his own property. And he's been having this on his mind, but he's never kind of actioned on it. If I kind of got that right, I didn't quote that by, by, uh, verbatim. So um, a lot of the questions are around like location, have we got the farm yet? Um, and, and things like that. So Till, do you want to speak to that first? And then I'm going to head over to uh, Darren next. Yeah, so uh, my understanding of the bricklet, bricklet model is that um, pretty much the accounts get funded up and then it's a simultaneous equ uh, not equation, transaction um, to buy the, the property. So the property is not already um, owned by us. Um, there's a few farms uh, that we're interested in. Um, yeah, that's is that, does that answer the question? Yeah, so I think it needs to be in New South Wales. I feel like we're looking in New South Wales corridor and the size of it um, to make, like Teal said a very good point to me a couple of weeks ago, was like working a 600 hectare farm or a 2000 hectare farm, the effort 80% is mostly the same, but the returns and what we can do uh, on that property is much more uh, activated when it's larger and larger scaled, especially because we want this to be a case study uh, for regenerative and we want to push the science and the DPI stocking rates. We want to kind of say, we're going to go beyond, you know? Um, and so um, we, we can't play around with those kind of boundaries if we don't have land that's kind of large enough. And also, um, you, you know, one of the other aspects on top of this is that we're talking about land prices. And one of the things that's top of mind for a lot of farmers and landowners is the carbon farming market. So, you know, sequestering that carbon, locking that into the soil is another vehicle that's going to increase appreciation, which we haven't even spoken about, or we're not even sure if that's going to be a route. So we, we you know, there's lots of options of layering different enterprises on the, on the farm that's only going to make the land more attractive and more sought after uh, for appreciation. Uh, Darren, people are asking, with a bricklet, do you get voting rights and can you steer the decision of the land through the bricklet model? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, everybody, everybody that owns, um, you know, a piece of the property, they're all co-owners. So it's all managed by uh, a co-ownership deed that anybody who who is a co-owner signs up to, and 
basically how it works is that there's a there's voting system. So if there's any decisions to be made, um, you know, there's there's a voting platform that, that people can um, can access if they you know want to have some active say or active vote into the property decisions. But keep in mind that the ownership is of the property, right? So it's only going to affect how it gets leased, how long it gets leased, or you know what the lease amount is. You know things like um, you know I saw a few things about cattle versus uh, vegetables. Um, you know decisions about the operation or, or what the actual business does is not part of what Bricklet does. So even though you're a part owner of um, of the land, you are only owning the land, and then um, and the business is leasing the land. So just wanted to make that that clear that it's kind of you know as an as a part owner of the land. Um, you know, you can help make decisions around that, but you're, make, you're not making decisions on the actual business itself or the farm itself. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Yep. And I think that's a really valid point as well, is that those stacked enterprises are kind of different. Um, but I, I think, you know, that it's, you know, having voting rights and the ability to make decisions. The, the, I guess the next question is, and correct me if I'm wrong, when, when, when there's like a share system and like a unit trust, if someone wants to exit, that kind of needs to be voted against or a majority accepting like people can't just put the rug under the, the project so is that the same with bricklet like if someone wants to sell their bricklet do they have to get approval or are they just listed on the platform yeah there's no there's no approval process for for that it's like owning shares in a company like an asx right think of it's like the asx of property and once you own a piece um you know you own that piece of land and but you can trade that at any time you can sell at any time so if you buy five bricklets today um, you can sell one of them tomorrow, two of them tomorrow. It doesn't really matter. So you've still got, you own those until you sell them. And it's really simple. You go into the marketplace and you put them up for sale. Um, and then, you know, like every other marketplace or every other uh, way to sell property is that you then need a buyer to be able to buy that. So obviously, you know, we want to be promoting and building this, um, you know, this, I guess, community of, of people that want to buy, you know, pieces of property because we want to make sure that when someone, you know, does want to sell, there's always going to be someone that wants to buy. Yeah, uh, just on that note, I'll just quickly share um, the Bricklet um, I guess platform. So this is what I guess the I guess you'd say the marketplace. Um, oh yeah, marketplace looks like. Um, so say imagine here there's a, there's a farm, and it's the, our Meta Farm one, um, or more specifically your Meta Farm one. Um, so this is it. You can click on it. Um, Bricklets are sale. Uh, I don't have a funded account yet, so I don't think I can buy one. Um, but this is pretty much where you get a lot of the information, um, or at least from uh, the bricklet side of things. And then you get um, the, uh, I guess, information and, and the ways to to buy and sell. So hope, hopefully that clears up um, a lot of, I guess, thoughts about how that, that works. Mm. And, and I think it's also good too that you can, you know, friends and family, you might have a bricklet and you're like, oh, I really need a, you know, the word used is make it liquid. I need a liquid, this, this bricklet. Um, and you can, and say, look, you want to buy my bricklet? I'm going to sell it for X amount. It's worth, you know, we got it for 15. It's now worth 20. I'll do it for you for 18 because we're friends and family. You can then pass it to friends and family quite easily through the platform. Um, so you can find your own local buyer or you can list it on the platform. And it's in our best interest that when a bricklet goes on board, on up for sale like we want that resold you know so we're going to also be behind the project to make sure that those bricklets get snapped up or someone in the community who has one might go oh there's another one available i'm going to snap it up and add an extra bricklet to my portfolio so so that that that's quite interesting um darren overseas investing or people from overseas like what kind of uh things do people need to keep in mind when it comes from our overseas audience so uh, people can, you know, people from overseas can buy uh, property or can buy bricklets in, um, you know, in the in the properties. Um, the the thing that is uh, that needs to be noted is the the foreign investment review board. But given that this is commercial property, uh, depending on you know the type of farm, but I think most farms are covered under the commercial asset um, rules. So I think so long as the, the farm itself is under. I think the threshold is 260, just over 260 million. So as long as the farm itself is under that uh, value, and I'm talking about just the property, um, then you know there's no FIRB uh, concessions to it. So um, so it is fairly straightforward uh, for an international buyer to buy into it. Awesome, love that. 
Um, how is the leasing kind of worked out? Is there a percentage of the bought price and who owns the carbon credits? Maybe Teal, you can answer that. Um, Darren, how, how, how does the land, how does the lease kind of work out? Is it a percentage of the, the price? Is it agreed? Does it go up with inflation? Yeah, so CPR? The percentage, I mean, it's, it's uh, for anyone that's, that's ever done a commercial lease before, it's, it's exactly the same as, as any kind of commercial lease. So the um, which is negotiated um, between you know the operator, so it's effectively the operator of the farm will will pay um, you know whatever the whatever the dollar amount is, which is then converted into a lease um, to give that percentage. So if, if I go back to that other example where we had um, the pub, it worked out to be four point four, let's say about four point five six percent as the lease. Um, as the yield, right? So you can work that the dollar and the percentage amounts are very similar once you actually do the calculation. Yep, awesome. Till, who owns the carbon credits of the land and, and the other things that are stacked on top of the enterprise? Yeah, so it's my understanding that um, the carbon credit program, so that will be with MetaFarm. And so the carbon credits produced will um, be owned by MetaFarm. Um, I think otherwise it borders on, I think a problem, Darren will have a better understanding of this than me. Um, I think it borders on a problem with having too much exposure to the business. Is that? Yeah, correct. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. I guess um, the a lot of the value that comes from soil organic carbon specifically comes from the ability for that to increase your uh, soil fertility. And so when we think about it as owners of a uh, property, if that increases uh, your uh, production, and, and, and definitely if we're in a, a drought area, increasing soil organic carbon is the best way to increase your drought resistance, um, as well as some other um, practices too. But in terms of uh, increasing soil fertility to protect ourselves from drought, having um, really fertile soils and and soils that can soak up a lot more rain um, pretty much increases the value of that soil um, and so the farm too. Yep. And and I think we've got to remember too that um, everything that's embodied on the, the, the farm, if it's improved biodiversity, if it's improved fertility, if it is carbon credits, is only going to increase the value of the land. So, you know, in 20 years time, like our goal is not to sell this property, but if the group says yes, you know, we, we, we then go and say, well, we've got X amount of carbon in the soil. We've got all this biodiversity. This property is now worth X times more than all the neighboring properties who didn't jump on and treat their land in a regenerative way. And that's like one of the goals uh, for Teal and I is to make this land so um, transformational that people are kind of going, how did you do that? Like, we want this to become like a showcase cut, case study farm that people all around the world lean on um, to, to, to show what's possible. I saw one of the, the, I'm, I'm, the, the questions are streaming in so fast. I'm trying to keep things like topical, but I think we're just going to have to bounce around. Um, David put an example here saying, um, so the number of bricklets equals the cost of the farm. So we're all the farm as a, uh, sorry. So we all own the farm as a piece of a property. Then Meta Farms runs the property by leasing the property from the bricklet owners. Have you got it correct? Yes, that is correct. So there will be a lease in place to say, here's the collective commons of the owners. Um, there's a lease in place. Meta Farms will lease that and pay money every month um, into that fund. And then that gets distributed to all the bricklet, bricklet owners uh, as a return. So um, Till, did you want to speak to some of those numbers of what that percentage kind of looks like? Sorry, the percentage for? Return on a bricklet. Oh, return on a bricklet. So, um, so three percent. So currently, we're thinking three percent for a uh, lease, and then um, so the five-year um, uh, average for the New England area in terms of appreciation. I think from the Rural Bank report was eight point two percent, and the twenty-year uh, compound interest was eight percent. I think. Um, which would put the the uh, annual return at eleven point two or eleven percent. Yeah. Um, so they're the kind of the figures uh, we're thinking. A lot of a lot of especially in grazing properties, a lot of uh, your return comes from appreciation uh, rather than um, uh, lease, and that's that's pretty much across the board. Awesome. 
Um, what happens with stamp duty? Is stamp duty applicable, Darren? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's a, each purchase is a purchase of property, so there's stamp duty um, paid on each piece. Yep, and then that would be also capital gains and all that jazz as well? Yeah, correct, yeah. Awesome. Uh, cool, cool. Teal, I don't know if you want to skim through and see if there's any questions you can cherry pick out. Um, while you do that, I might ask Martin. I can see he's got his hand up. Martin, if you could keep your question to like 30 seconds to a minute um, and um, feel free to unmute and speak. Or maybe, yep, cool. Yeah, sure. Uh, I'm Martin from Kenya, especially in the camp of refugee, Kakuma. And uh, this is my first time uh, to meet or to be in this space of uh, metaphor. And I'm very happy because uh, I'm just learning something from my friends. But unfortunately, I think I'll be shut out uh, due to the connectivity. Yeah. No That's okay. So Thank you for I joining us. To say, my, yes, I mean, is only to introduce. So I'm working with BDA too. Uh, BDA2 is a local uh, uh, CBO, a grassroots CBO, which is working with the, the refugees, both hot community and the, uh, and the refugee here in the camp. Awesome. So if you want to meet us, uh, I'm going to share our page, uh, the name of our page and our email. And the, yeah, sure. Awesome. Okay. We'll pop that in the link and we can follow it on. And uh, thank you for coming up and saying hello. Um, I have to say that there are so many farmers in Kenya and that that just farm so beautifully and respect the land and really, um, you know, showcase what we can all be doing. So, um, you know, biodynamics, yeah, yeah. generative, it's it's really great to see the work that you guys are doing over there. Yeah, yeah, yeah sure. Uh, in Kenya, but a place where uh, I am living or a place where I locate, it is a part of, of a semi, a totally dry land. So I'm trying to plant some trees so that I can, I can make it green. Yeah, awesome. Your connection's a little bit breaky, so I might just mute you and um, share what you can in the chat. It might be a little bit easier for us to follow along. Um, so thanks very much, Martin. Um, Teal, did you cherry pick any questions? Yeah, fair one. So are uh, um, borrowings used in the purchase or is it 100% bricklet funded? So um, it's 100% bricklet funded. Uh, Darren, I think you have partners which uh, you can um, borrow to then get a bricklet. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, so we, uh, we have a couple of partners, that uh, lending partners that let you lend up to kind of, I think it's about $80,000 to buy bricklets. So um yeah there is the opportunity to do that there's no there's no finance on the actual property itself yeah absolutely leanne yeah. said um oh sorry Till, did you want to say more oh no no and it's just one thing um like when we think about family and we think of, um we're trying to keep it as uh safe or, or de-risk as much as possible and so just not having uh debt in the equation just makes everything so much more simple absolutely um yeah, cool. Well, I think that's, that's what Leanne said. Um, it might be best to put a prospectus together. That's 100% what will happen next. Um, we're just really like raising your hand, expression of interest uh, at this stage at the moment. Because um, um, then I think what's really important is that from all the questions and the, this feedback loop, we're able to kind of tweak that to exactly what people want. So look, this is like really creating an amazing like FAQ kind of document that we can then kind of go back and and answer and put on our um I am, I believe they call them these days information memorandum. Um, so uh, we will definitely have that in place. So that way everyone can go and do their right due diligence. So um, yeah, cool. So I don't know if there's any other questions that I've missed. Um, oh, I got one question. Um, is a farmer that runs a property employed or does uh, he rent the place? So it's uh, rent out uh, or, or leased. Um uh, the reason for that is so it's predictable, um, I guess, cash flow for the owners, the bricklet owners. All right. Well, I think that's a lot of the questions. Um, I don't know if there's anything else. Darren, do you want to tie up any loose threads or anything that's kind of buzzing on in your mind about what people have said and some of the questions and what we've said? 
Yeah, I think I think the main uh, the main theme is just to know that you know the bricklet is uh, is for the property itself, and the, the lease is the is the payment. Um, you know, is the is the income for the owners, um, and it is paid generally on a monthly basis. So that the lease is typically a monthly paid lease. So there was a question about that. Um, you know, can there be? You know, can it be a, a, a I guess a um, a small group of owners that owns a particular asset um, doesn't matter. It doesn't have to be thousands of people. It could be ten or twenty people that own an asset. Um, there's no kind of limits, minimums, or maximums on that um, because it is purely just just property. Um, I think they're the main things um, to cover off at this point. Yeah, awesome. Um, and one of the questions here was also about like other returns paid monthly to each bricklet owner. Is it annually? How how is it paid out to the owners? Yeah, monthly. Yeah, yeah. Well, cool. typically it's, it's it's whatever's in the lease agreement, which we aim for monthly. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. And um, someone else asked who will be funding all the farm operations that will be part of the Meta Farms uh, business unit of kind of running the farm. So the uh, there will be some kind of working capital, I guess, raised in this as well. But uh, that's mainly just to get the farm set up, acquiring the land, settling on the land. Um, and, and like, we're ready to move on this as fast as we possibly can. So, uh, the more people who raise their hands, uh, do the expression of interest, um, then the more we can kind of get feedback loops and, and, and take this to, uh, to, to different landowners. So we've been looking at this land, these lands for the last couple of months, um, and working with different vendors about what needs to happen from their point of view as well. Um, sometimes, you know, longer settlements need to be put in place so that way we can uh, set up all the bricklet moving parts and things like that. So uh, we are feet on the ground and, uh, you know, doing what we can to do all the moving parts. And this webinar is one of those um, things as well. So um, is there any question that we've missed or I've missed that you kind of... Really uh, so, sorry, I saw another one. So when we buy the bricklet, I, I get a return on lease, uh, no other cost. So... Um, yeah, there, were, there is no other costs um, after you, you purchase the bricklet. Say, for example, um, this is you know worst case scenario, the uh, person leasing the farm goes uh, bankrupt or whatever, then it'll just be like any other um, uh, person leasing a, a commercial property. They pretty much get turfed out and then it would be leased out to to someone else. <clears throat> um, Leanne says, will Meta Farms Hydro Limited be the leaseholder? Yes, at this stage, that kind of is the idea, whether it be another uh, entity that is set up for the for the lease, but um, it will be, you know, the Meta Farms operating kind of business that leases it back uh, to to all the to the landholders. Mm. Oh, another thing um, that I think everyone will find pretty interesting is that we're, we're keen to have it all pretty open source learning. And so we'd like to set up um, uh, dashboards and, um, uh, programs where you can see exactly where we're moving the cattle across your farm and um, and have a uh, a daily update on a far on the farm, pretty much through through maps or um, something like that. So I'm not exactly sure how that would uh, be set up, but it would be keen to um to work on setting something up like that. I think the operation side of the farm is, you know, with working and meeting so many farmers over the years is innovation technology and, um, and working smarter rather than harder is definitely something that can innovate a lot um, using GPS locations of stuff, um, you know, fences that move themselves. Um, they're all the things that we kind of want to prototype and work with and, and say that the, this is kind of the new way forward of farming um, that still you know, that nurtures the land and, and rebuilds the biodiversity and brings back um, species that haven't been seen. So um, yeah, that, that is, you know, kind of at the core value. And if you've been hanging around me, you know, that that's kind of like what we do. We love to like, you know, COVID hit and we run a web summit, you know, that ran for 10 days. It's like, we're always using technology and being first to make things happen when the world goes in a different direction. And that's kind of happening now as well. And we're like, how do we get this land and how do we bring multiple people involved and like ride this wave uh, together and, and, and use technology to innovate. We, I envision a dashboard where we can see exactly where each cattle is, you know, how much water they're drinking, um, you, you know, how much you know, steps they've taken throughout the day. And then that way we can see, what the meat quality is like and do new research to say, you know, re readings of this meant, meant that the, the cattle drunk this much water, the rest are drinking less. How do we encourage them to drink more water? You know, the nutrient, nutrient density of the grasses, the bricks readings, the, 
um, everything kind of data driven farming is kind of what is driving me um, to really set up. We want gates that open on timers and, you know, where the sun is and the brightness, you know, that's the kind of fun stuff that we want to be able to do um, and really showcase what um, is possible with the technology that's out there. And someone mentioned, you know, blockchain uh, in the chat as well. And they're, they're things that we're also playing around with as well. And there's lots of blockchain technology with, um, you know, tracking cattle and, 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 and all food from, you know, seeds to plate um, and that logistics of, of, of food uh, and tracking. So it's pretty exciting times, you know, so I'm so glad that there's so many questions and I don't know if we're going to be able to get all of them, but, but as Till mentioned before, in a couple of weeks' time, uh, we're going to be running another webinar that's going to go more into the details of the farm. Um, and that's because, like, there's a couple of different farms that we could go down, depending on the interest of these calls. And and um, keep in mind that, you know, you might have heard this and gone, well, I'm not really in a position, but keep in mind who you might be able to invite. You know, there might be friends, family, brothers, sisters, parents, uh, other people in your network that you might think, gee, this is exactly what they're kind of after. Um, so it's not necessarily, you know, the right time for you. That's completely fine. We don't want anyone to ever be stretched in a position like this. Um, so, you, you know, share it around the, the the more that we can bring into these kind of rooms and talk about this as a new concept and a new way forward. And it's not really new because Brickler's been doing it for years. It's just that hasn't been really positioned in a way of owning farm or doing bricklets on a farm project that's kind of the new concept um so so yeah so it's, um the links there you will need to put your hand up as an expression of interest um to then get invited to that next webinar so i see a few people have already filled that out um confirming that i've got david lizards and uh, jabbar and gundy so thank you so much for filling those out um, oh, and another form just popped in there as well. So that my Slack just updated. So thanks very much. Teal, do you want to mention anything while I read the last 10 questions that have come in? Yeah, I was just going to answer a question. Um, it was about who uh, who covers insurance and whatnot. So uh, the lease C would um, cover like, pretty much all costs. I think it's called a triple net lease. Is that right, Darren? Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. Yeah. So it's everything, rates, insurance, it, like everything. It, um, commercial real estate is uh, so much different to residential real estate. Um, it's pretty much, you don't worry about anything, I guess. Um, if the paychecks are coming in from uh, the LAC, then then I guess it's, it's good. Awesome. I love um, Gandhi. You said, I love it. This is exactly what the world needs. And I couldn't agree more. You know, we need to bring more power to the people, um, bring it, you know, kind of many, many parts make the whole, you know, a uh, 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 holistic management kind of principle and, um, you know, together and the biodiversity of people is really important as well. That's one of the principles of Regen Ag is biodiversity. And it's not just plants, bugs, but it's about the people, the heart, the soul, the spirits, the experience. Uh, I think that's a really key part that's missing in a lot of the Regen Ag kind of models is the is the who and and the us and we so um yeah really exciting someone's decided to share a whiteboard amazing <laughs> cool so i'm not sure how we're going to end that but um oh there it goes perfect so yeah awesome well darren yeah thanks so much for joining us along i know it's been a bit of a roller coaster webinar uh, uh lots of so questions good. i think really positive sign no, excellent. Excellent. Well, yeah, glad to be here and kind of talk through the, you know, the details. Obviously, a lot of questions and there always is, um, you know, when, when people hear about it for the first time. So, you know, keen to, um, you know, to, to explore it further with you guys and, and, you know, follow up with any, you know, any more webinars and, and you know, obviously share as much information as we can. Yeah, love that. Awesome. And thanks so much. Um, you know, Bricklet's been amazing. Every time we've said, let's have a meeting, we're there and phone calls, text messages. You know, I think that's why it's really important. It's, you know, about who you partner with and making that, make sure that we're all on the same page. And um, I remember Teal coming out of that meeting going, oh my God, Bricklet's the answer to everything we've been having question marks on. You know, I was like, I know, that's why I wanted to introduce you to him. <laughs> so, so um, it's really good to, you know, work with great partners and, and make this kind of happen uh, really quickly as well. So thanks everyone for coming along. Till, any final words from yourself? Yeah, we'll write up uh, the answers to the questions in a, in a some document and, and put it out. Yep, I think so. I think doing a Q&A, frequently asked questions kind of document or even popping them all on the website um, is a good next step. So thanks everyone for 
coming along. It's been super fun. Really enjoyed it. Um, the feedback has been amazing. So fill out the expressions of interest form, share it with friends, family, brief them in. The replay will come out. Well, the replay is actually already available on YouTube. That's one of the reasons why we stream this live. So as soon as we end it, um, if you go to our YouTube channel um, and look for the video, you, you basically got the replay. So if you want to share it with friends and family ASAP, then uh, please come along. The expression of interest form um, ideally will be open until the end of the week. That way we can just get a bit of a gauge of numbers. Um, and so if you could get that sorted uh, end of week, the, uh, the email <clears throat> that you'll get post this webinar will kind of uh, remind you about that as well. Yeah, right. one more thing. <laughs> one more thing to get everyone throwing more questions out. Darren, it's my understanding that people can use self-managed super fund. Is that right to buy bricklets? Yeah, that's correct as well. Yeah, absolutely. So um, people can, anyone can use their self-managed super fund to buy the property as well. Yeah, so there you go. Uh, I don't know if that raises more questions, but um, that's op yeah. uh, another option um, if people want to go down that. But again, talk to your, talk to your trusted financial advisors. Awesome. All right. Well, on that note, thank you very much, everyone, for hanging out with us on this Monday afternoon or evening. I'll let everyone kind of get on with the rest of their night. Um, it's been a blast. Um, if you've got more questions um, and some people have put in their hand up to be the farm manager already. So that's that's awesome. So thank you, thank you very much for everyone who came along. Um, I, I, yeah, I guess on that note, until next time, get outside, get your hands dirty and keep deeper into our wonderful world of soils. Thanks very much, everyone. Have a great night. Cheers. Cheers.